So welcome to another micro seminar. My name is Sarah Preheim, and I'm part of the ISME's Early Career uh, Scientist Committee. And we've joined forces with people from um, micro seminars, so that's Dave, Cam, and Lizzie, uh, to offer different ways for people to share their science while we're stuck at home dealing with the coronavirus. Um, and I just want to say my heart goes out to anyone who is personally infected with the virus um, and also for those first responders and nurses and doctors and researchers who are um, putting themselves out there on the front line to, to try to find a cure and to help other people, your heroes, and uh, keep up the good work and stay safe. Um, for those of you like me who are just stuck at home, um, trying to keep up uh, and get our science out there while there are a lot of the seminars and, and co conferences being canceled, um, consider signing up for a micro seminar and giving a micro seminar. Um, uh, you can find the sign up page if you Google um, Go Viral Is Me. And um, we have a lot of great speakers coming up in the next few weeks if you're interested in um, participating in these seminars. So, and it's my great pleasure to start out uh, this seminar uh, today by introducing our speaker, Gwen Pagano. And Gwen got her PhD from the University of Lyon, France, and then did, a P, uh, did her postdoc at the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. And she is currently the um, director of a director of research at um, CNRS in France, and she's the leader of the evolutionary and environmental genomics of phytoplankton group there. And she's going to be sharing her work today about virus uh, phytoplankton uh, coexistence through the genomic lens. So, Gwen, thank you very much for being here, and you can go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I have all these windows of myself and yourself and Dave on the side, that's fine. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so I'm Gwenaëlle Pigano. I, I come from France. So my lab has been closed on the 16th of March. And I would uh, like to start by saying a, a very big uh, thank you to Sarah, David and all the micro seminar uh, a group for organizing this uh, very um, very uh, important and uh, timely seminars and I think that's uh, the right thing to do and I hope it will also continue after uh, this terrible time. Okay, so my trip from banyul sur mer to Baltimore was, uh, was very, very rapid. Um, in my group, we are working on eukaryotic phytoplankton. So uh, this is a um, eukaryotic tree of life and eukaryotic phytoplankton is, is phylogenetically very diverse. So all colored branch on this tree represent a phytoplanktonic eukaryote. Okay, and in my group, we are focusing our energy and our time on some of these phytoplanktonic eukaryotes that belong to uh, the green lineage, the Archiplastida, who also contains the land plants. And this uh, family of phytoplankton we are particularly fond of uh, are uh, Mammielophyceae. So Mammielophyceae uh, can be found everywhere in, 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 in marine waters. Uh, they comprise some very small eukaryotes, uh, some of the smallest photosynthetic eukaryotes. So here you have a bacterial sized cell of Osteococcus. Uh, it's one micrometer um, large. But you have other Mammielophyceae who are a little bit uh, larger, so two micrometer with scale. So this is a Baticoccus, and also some flagellate Mammielophyceae. So this is a mi Micromonas. So their very small size comes with a simple cellular organization. So one large chloroplast, one mitochondria. Uh, they are ecologically important, especially in uh, coastal areas. So maybe I can just move this away. Huh. Um, oops. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, so this is a, a satellite image from our planet with um, the chlorophyll fluorescence. So you can see there's a lot of, uh, of photosynthesis going on at the surface of the ocean. And while bacteria are responsible for most of this, in open ocean areas, eukaryotes are thought to be very important in coastal areas. And to illustrate 
Oops. To illustrate the ecological importance of Manuel Officier, I wanted to show you a figure from uh, the work of Daniel Volos group published 2018 uh, about a meta barcoding study uh, uh, from the ocean sampling day in 2014, where they, uh, well, sequence the 18S the bosomal DNA in 122 sites across the world. And in 120 out of the 122, they had um, uh, Manuel Officier. And the Manuel Officier represented a very large proportion of these uh, green algae. Uh, most uh, green algae uh, are haploids, and this is a case for um, Manuel Officier too. Um, they have compact genomes, so this you can see that you can actually make a pulse field gel electrophoresis with these genomes where you can actually visualize the karyotype. They are relatively uh, easy to grow in the lab, so I put brackets because the more and more we work and we uh, set up collaboration with other groups, we realize that uh, the growth of Mamielo is is not that easy indeed. We have a lot of problems that can arise through contamination, marine bacterial contamination. And the division rate is grossly one division per day. And so all these features make them very interesting models to study different aspects of plant systems biology, but also more generally um, in uh, environmental genomics by comparing uh, in silico prediction with biological data. So um, in my group, we have been uh, isolating uh, and identification Manuel Officier for the last 15 years. And our historical uh, pipeline for doing this is, um, is uh, uh, sampling water, uh, filtrating it. So typically, if we, if we want to search for uh, osteococcus, we will filtrate through one dot, uh, um, one dot two micrometer. We put it in sterile um, growth media and wait a nice green color to appear. Wait, yeah, wait for this. Then we'll clone it through plates, uh, re-inoculate it in sterile um, uh, growth media, extract the DNA and sequence the 18S. Okay, and the 18S will allow us to uh, have the uh, taxonomic affiliation of this strain. Okay, so um, my lab and others have been actively involved in um, getting genomic resources for these manual offices. So there are more than, than 12 genomes available um, to date. And um, the first, um, the first, one of the first output of these uh, genome data becoming available for these uh, uh, for this organism was uh, the very large cryptic divergences between species. So for example, here you can see uh, Osteococcus species. If you align uh, the, the genes of these two genomes and you uh, estimate the uh, percent of amino acid identity between two Osteococcus over the whole genome, you'll get 70% amino acid identity. And this value is actually uh, very similar to the value you would obtain if you would do the same between birds and primates. So this is to illustrate the very um, ancient divergence within a group of organisms who's morphologically actually uh, indistinguishable. And if you compare this to the best known unicellular eukaryote, that is uh, the Saccharomyces yeast, you can see that within the Osteococcus uh, genera, you have a higher divergence than with, uh, within the Saccharomyces the cerevisiae sensu stricto group. Okay. Um, so in 2006, uh, Nigel Grimsley from my uh, group uh, isolated the first Osteococcus virus. And paradoxically, these viruses, um, they are double-stranded DNA viruses, and they are part of the giant virus family. So giant, vi giant viruses infected, infecting the smallest um, 
photosynthetic eukaryotes. So this is a phylogeny of uh, giant viruses by uh, Kuhn and Yutin 2018. So here you can see the genome sizes of the different viruses. So the, the, the largest giant virus here is Pandoravirus salinis and FICO DNA, uh, well, presinoviruses are part of the FICO DNA viridae family, and they have um, relatively small genomes of 200 kilobases. Okay, so we are working on Mamilophyce, who are haploid genomes, 13 to 20 megabases, 17 to 21 chromosomes, and the viruses infecting them. So these are double-stranded linear uh, genomes of 180 to, well, 200 kilobases approximately. And we use this data to um, uh, tackle two kinds of questions uh, about cell immunity. So the first question is, um, what are the genomic signatures of cell immunity to viruses and natural populations? And the second one is, uh, how does cell immunity evolve? And to address these two questions, we combine uh, two, two types of approach, population genomics and experimental evolution. So how do we assess cell immunity of our cultures and practice? So there are several ways to do it. Um, what you would, um, um, uh, what I present here is that basically we, we inoculate our cultures, our axonic cultures uh, with uh, some virus particles. And then we look at the uh, dynamic of the system with time. So if the number of microalgae decreases and the number of viruses increases, we will say this algae is susceptible to the virus. If uh, the virus does not increase and the microalgae continues to grow, is the microalgae will be resistant. And if we have a, a double signal of microalgae and virus growth, we will say that uh, we, we've got uh, some tolerance going on. So how do we do that in practice? Uh, we do not systematically follow the growth of algae and viruses by cytometry. We actually use a visual test. So basically, we grow cultures until uh, cell density um, reaches more than 1 million per ml. And when we add the virus, we will observe um, a decoloration of the culture. And this will be interpreted as a susceptibility to the virus we added. Another a little bit more precise way to do this is to grow our microalgae and plates and inoc inoculate uh, either the environment or the virus in duplicate. Here you can see that here you have uh, susceptibility to the inoculate and here resistance to the inoculate. Okay, so we did that with 32 uh, Osteococcus story viruses we have uh, isolated in my group onto uh, 13 Osteococcus uh, microalgae that we had also isolated from the environment. So what we may have is, um, okay, I wanted to, to, to remove this. Uh, yes, up, oh, voila. So what we, uh, what we obtained, so it's either lysis, partial lysis, or no lysis. Uh, so you can see that there's a huge variation in the cell immunity uh, of the different osteococcus strains. So some strains like this one is uh, susceptible to most viruses. Whereas this strain is also a osteococcus strain, but it seems to be resistant to most of the viruses. So we were interested in uh, the, uh, the genomic uh, basis of these uh, differences in susceptibility. So uh, we uh, boarded on a population genomic uh, project, thanks to the Joint Genome Institute and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who um, uh, founded the sequencing of uh, respectively 12 Osteococcus tori strain and seven Osteococcus Mediterranean strains. And we're interested in uh, the polymorphism within this population. So uh, this is um, the analysis of the whole genome single nucleotide uh, polymorphism spectrum uh, obtained from this data. 
So the only um, the only value you are um, you have to note is this value here. This is a, a pairwise synonymous diversity. So basically, this is statistics that estimates if you randomly take two Australopithecus story strains from a population, you align them, and you look at the number of differences they have on the synonymous sites. So the synonymous site is a grossly the third position in each codon that's where a change doesn't change the amino acid. So it's 1%, okay? And um, because it's calculated on the synonymous position and it says independent of uh, the number of genes in the genome, you can actually compare this value between species. And so the value we obtain from single nucleotide polymorphism is completely in line with what, what has been observed in other species. So it's, uh, lo it's lower than what is observed in the nematode and in Drosophila, but it's higher than what is available in other unicellular, um, um, unicellular eukaryote as a Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Okay. So population genomics has been lagging uh, behind a little bit in phytoplanktonic species, uh, mostly due to the fact that actually, well, we don't have that many strains yet. Uh, so um, on this eukaryotic tree of life, since uh, uh, our studies or two novel studies have been published, at least, I hope I'm not missing anything. So one on the data on Emiliana Huxley and one in uh, Phaidactylum uh, tricornutum. Okay, and the synonymous, um, the synonymous polymorphism detected uh, was uh, surprisingly low for both of these species. Okay, um, when you look at single nucleotide polymorphism, you can uh, check well what is going on on um, synonymous sites, intergenic sites, but also on polymorphism that you think uh, affect fitness. Okay, so non-synonymous uh, mutation and nonsense mutation. Nonsense mutations, they actually introduce a stop codon into a sequence. So they are, uh, have a, they, have a, they are like knockout mutations. And this is just to show you that our data set is perfectly consistent with what is expected from population genetics theory. You have much less non-synonymous and nonsense uh, SNPs and they segregate at lower frequency in the populations. So basically this um, single nucleotide polymorphism analysis is just to convince you that uh, the data set we have, it's a bona fide population genomic data set. It is a population, low levels of diversity. We also had loads of recombination, okay? However, we had something uh, we noticed quite early in the analysis and that did not make sense. And this came from the coverage of the genome. So uh, on this uh, picture, here you, you have um, uh, the chromosome three and one megabuzz. And the, read, the number of read is on average in this uh, small genome, it's over a hundredfold. But um, there, there, there are regions uh, that are not uh, as well covered as others. So on chromosome three, here you have all 12 strands of the population, the reference genome. Everything is red, everything is well covered. But on one chromosome, that is chromosome 19, which is 300 kilobase per long, um, we have a big variation in coverage with many strains having zero coverage at different places of this chromosome. So this chromosome um, uh, had, um, had, had received some attention when the first Manielofice genomes were coming out uh, because it had a different GC content and a lower gene density than the standard chromosome. So that's why it was named the small outlier chromosome. So when we realized this and uh, um, we uh, saw uh, how many single nucleotide polymorphism we had for each strain, um, we realized that um, it, it would be diff well, it would be difficult with the present data set to do genome-wide association studies to try to understand uh, the polymorphism associated with different resistance or susceptible strains. However, what we saw is that there was a, a very surprising relationship between the length of this outlier chromosome and the susceptibility of the microalgae to presenoviruses. 
So uh, we have a, a collection of viruses in my, in my lab. And so some strains seem to be susceptible to most of these viruses. So it calls them susceptible strains. And some strains uh, are, seem to be resistant to most of these viruses. And these would be the resistant strains. And if you plot <laughs> the, the, the resistant to susceptible, so 100% would be you are susceptible to 100% of the strain and, and, and zero is none of the virus we have can ever lies you. We have this uh, significant negative relationship between the length of this chromosome and the susceptibility. So strains that have large uh, outlier chromosomes tend to be more resistant to lysis than uh, strains with shorter chromosomes. So we wanted to know, uh, yeah, to have the, to get the sequence of this chromosome, and because the Illumina data set was um, was uh, insufficient to get a proper uh, assembly of this chromosome, due to the repetitive nature of this uh, sequence, uh, we did some uh, pack bio sequencing for six strains, uh, for coverage of eighty four, and realized the H gets three assembly. And this is what we obtained. So these are the six uh, chromosomes that have been uh, reassembled telomere to telomere uh, from 250 to 450 uh, kilo, yeah, kilobases on average. And uh, what we saw um, was very surprising in the sense that uh, it was impossible to align these chromosomes. Where was it? possible to align the other standard chromosome from beginning to end, this chromosome could not be aligned. So uh, what we did, we uh, tried to organize this, uh, this mess into uh, three categories. The third category uh, would be um, syntonic regions. So these are the regions that you can actually align between the different, uh, the different strains. Okay, so different shades of, of blue. Then you've got all the yellow parts. So the yellow parts, as you can see with all this dot, this is rearranged DNA. So it's DNA that is not unique to this uh, strain that can be found in the other strain, but it's completely rearranged all over the place. So this is uh, approximately one third of the chromosome. And the last third would be uh, what is gray here in the pie chart and corresponds to the to the red marks over the chromosomes. So this is a data, uh, this is sequence data that is unique to each strain. Okay, so when you want to look at what this sequence, well, this unknown sequence is, and you use sequence identity to um, uh, to, to search a gene bank, for example, for it. So most of um, most of the search are unsuccessful. So this is a low complexity DNA or DNA that has a low homology with what is in, in gene bank. And then the second best hit is about uh, sequences that come from uh, Mamirufisi. And basically these are genes that uh, come from other chromosomes. Okay, so meaning that this subchromosome is actually uh, the, um, um, the destination of translocation from genes that are uh, on the other chromosomes. And then for two strains, this one and this one, you have um, hundreds, a few nucleotides that actually uh, can be uh, shown to be uh, of presinovirus origin. So the conclusion of this first part about the genomic signatures of cell immunity to viruses in the natural population, taking cell immunity as a fixed trait, um, are that the immunity to presinoviruses is variable within natural populations of Australococcus. Uh, that within the genome of the microalgae, one chromosome size increases with antiviral resistance. And the population genomics analysis uh, demonstrated that this chromosome uh, is hypervariable. Uh, it's a novel type of hypervariability. And this level of hypervariability uh, must be generated by massive rearrangements. 
and the massive rearrangement recall a kind of rearrangement that have been reported in um, in um, in another domain, well, not in uh, environmental microbiology, maybe in um, the evolution of, of cancer cells, where it's called chromotrypsis, where part of a, a chromosome is like dissolved and stitched stitch back together in a completely um, rearranged fashion. So this was looking at cell immunity as a fixed trait. But now we know that cell immunity doesn't, is not a fixed trait. So um, when we are patient enough to wait for the evolution of uh, microalgae and viral particles in our test tubes, after um, three, four, or, um, or, or five days, actually, we often observe that uh, the microalgae are fighting back and are growing back again and evolving resistance. And in my second part, I'm going uh, to talk to you about uh, a case study of a strain that has been isolated as a, a, what I call in this graph a tolerant uh, strain, a strain that is growing well and looking very healthy while maintained uh, a viral population. So this is strain RCC2590. And it is this strain here, Ostreococcus mediterraneus. And we were first interested in this strain because of its phylogenetic position. So we had the genomes of all these Osteococcus over here. And Osteococcus uh, branches at the basis of this tree. And we wanted to infer the evolution of the, the genome architecture within the Osteococcus lineage, the, G, the ancestral GC content, the ancestral number of genes. So we sequenced this genome, we isolated the strain in 2009, we extracted the DNA and sent it to the Genoscope, which is a French sequencing agency. And when the assembly came back, we noted that uh, the genome assembly contained a complete presenovirus. So Sherry Yo, who was a, a postdoc in the lab, went back to the cultures to check whether the culture uh, was uh, still producing this virus. So uh, by flow cytometry, uh, she monitored the evolution of the number of cells, so in green, the microalgae, Osteococcus mediterraneus, and then she used two different methods to estimate the number of viral particles. So here, the empty triangle, it's uh, um, cytometric counts, of viral particles and the uh, filled triangles. This is the number of uh, plaque formed by putting uh, the culture onto uh, plates. Okay. So while the estimates of the number of viruses is different by the two methods, what is very clear is that it is increasing with the number of algae, meaning that the microalgae culture is still producing the virus and has been producing this virus since its isolation in 2009. This is a, a picture about the, the, the genome of this resident virus we named the OMV2 because it's the second version of the virus infecting an Osteococcus mediterraneus strain. So it has a size of the presenovirus. It has a gene content of the presenovirus. Here you can see the phylogeny of the uh, polymerase B. So it branches within the other Osteococcus virus that have been isolated and sequenced. And um, like um, most uh, presenoviruses, uh, the transmission of the genome is not strictly vertical. You do have some um, um, some, some evidence of gene exchange, exchanges. So on, on this phylogeny here, uh, we plotted um, the number of genes, the proportion of genes of this genome that branch either here within the Mediterranean viruses. So most of the genes of this novel genome will branch within Osteococcus story and Osteococcus mediterraneus version one but 13% would actually uh, branch as an outgroup. And this, is, uh, this position is what you would expect um, if the speciation of the Osteococcus and, uh, and the, uh, if they had been co-speciation of both 
the presence of virus and its host, Astrococcus mediterraneus. Okay, so um, this observation that there was a virus being produced uh, for so many for so many years and still being produced uh, in the lab uh, raised uh, a lot of question because um, all the virus we have isolated by now they are lytic viruses. Uh, so we performed some transmission electron micrography to microscopy, sorry, uh, to understand what was going on in this culture. And so this is what we observed. So within our Osteococcus mediterraneus cultures, most of the cells look fine, you know, they are intact, you cannot see any virus. But CO.5% look like uh, lysed cells. So here you can see that the membrane is, uh, is, is, is not well, and here you can see the virus particle, actually. So we deduced from this that actually the projection of virus uh, was a consequence of cell lysis, and not like uh, some cells producing some viruses while staying intact. And because we're starting our cultures from single cells, and uh, we therefore call them isogenic, even we grow them until they reach several millions per cell, um, we um, made the hypothesis that uh, there was a switch between susceptible and resistant cells uh, within, uh, uh, within these cultures. So to investigate the consequences of this hypothesis, we, we did a, a little model in collaboration uh, with um, a team of um, uh, theoricians from the University of Perpignan. So basically, um, a susceptible cell, well, at the end of each day, each microalgae divides into two, okay? So we have to think about more generations than just one generation. And so over the, over the division, this susceptible chain will have a probability to switch to a resistant uh, cell. And the resistant cell uh, will have a probability that one of her grand, 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 granddaughters will evolve back to a susceptible uh, strain. The susceptible strains, they divide at a rate uh, AS. The resistant strains, they divide at a rate AR. And only the susceptible cells are producing viruses. And VS is the burst size. So it's the number of viral particles produced by a susceptible cell. So if you analyze this model, without virus, you have an exponential uh, algal growth. And if you add the virus, you will observe a decrease in microalgal growth, uh, followed by uh, an increase again. And uh, most importantly, after a certain time, you will observe that uh, the number of viruses and the number of microalgae actually uh, flow parallel paths. And this is actually um, the consequence of, um, of the, the susceptible the resistant cells that have been selected after the virus addition that will produce some susceptible cells that will be lysed and produce a virus. So the virus production uh, over here is, is just a consequence of the, um, the switch from resistant to susceptible cells by the resistant cells. Okay, so this uh, model fitted very well. So both uh, in this, at this point and at this point with what we observed in our cultures. Uh, however, how could we experimental validate that there, there was this switch existing uh, in isogenic culture? So first uh, we wanted to validate the resistant to susceptible switch. And to do that, we isolated one single cell out of a virus-free um, um, microalgal culture, okay? So this single cell divided into uh, many cells and we isolated N single cells from this culture. And then we waited for a few days to check the phenotype of these cells per lysis. So this is a cartoon of this experiment. So we had the virus-resistant mother line. We isolated with many daughters 
isolated uh, at the single the cell level. We wait a few days that they divide, we add the virus and we check for the susceptibility. And this is what we obtained. So we did that 240 times. Uh, we had 180 resistant uh, daughters and 48 susceptible daughters. And this has validated that you do have a switch from resistance to susceptible strain in this species. And you can even estimate that you have a minimum of 21% of resistant to susceptible switch. Okay, so that is part of the model. What about the reverse switch from susceptible to resistant microalgae? So we couldn't do that as directly. Uh, so what we did here, we, we took the susceptible cells we had just, uh, we had just obtained over here. Uh, we let them grow and we added the virus to see whether they could evolve resistance. So this is what you can see with one of these cells. Um, and indeed, so we added the viruses. First, there was a lysis, and then uh, the culture um, um, the culture grows uh, took over. Um, and if you if you make the assumption that actually this was due to resistant cells uh, being present at the beginning of the inoculation, you can uh, get the initial ratio of resistance to susceptible cell. It's one for thousand, and you can thus deduce that the uh, susceptible to resistance switch it's actually much lower than the reverse resistant to susceptible switch that we have estimated to be around 20%. So we can have some support for both switches from susceptible to resistant and from resistant to susceptible. So what, uh, what are the molecular basis? What are the genomic basis of this switch? So um, these are the haplotypes of the resistant mosaline. And here you have the haplotypes of three susceptible uh, grand-granddaughter lines that have evolved from this resistant mother line. And what you can see here is that, uh, so these are uh, radioactive labels that have been put for the small outlier chromosome of this strain. You can see that the susceptible lines, they have lost, they seem to have lost a piece of this chromosome. So what we did is that we uh, resequenced using long read sequencing again, because this chromosome is full of repeats, the uh, resistant and the susceptible, uh, one of the susceptible cells. So the resistant um, cell is uh, 600 kilobases and the susceptible line is 60 kilobases shorter. If you look at this region that has been deleted in the susceptible line, well, a lot of it can be found on other places of the chromosome, but you have seven genes that have been lost. So they are in, in this table here, uh, two uh, hypothetical proteins. We have no idea what they do, but then we have other genes that are involved in uh, sugar me metabolism. And because the, remo the deletion of these genes led to change from resistant to susceptible, these are some good candidates to be actually involved in the resistant phenotype of the strain. Then the, um, the re reciprocal questions, okay, so to switch from resistant to susceptible, you delete a piece of the outlier chromosome. How do you get from the susceptible back to the resistant switch? So for that, we, we don't have any data yet for uh, Osteococcus mediterraneus, but we had some previous knowledge uh, from uh, the evolution of resistant in another species, Osteococcus toei. So this was uh, Sherry's first post postdoctoral work on Osteococcus toei. So what she did, what we did there is to evolve um, control non-infected lines and infected lines. So you can see here that the, the color disappears and a resistance evolves. And what we did uh, in, in these times was doing RNA-seq sequencing of the control and the susceptible lines. And uh, what was found is that most transcription changes um, occurred on the outlier chromosome that in the species Osteococcus toei is on chromosome 19. 
So this is a, a cartoon of chromosome 19 in blue, the regions that are expressed in susceptible lines and in uh, pink, the regions that are expressed in resident lines. And you can see that there are some regions that are just switched off and on in resistant, very susceptible lines. The genes involved in these uh, changes of expression, uh, again, uh, uh, an awful lot of them, we have no idea what they do, but uh, a lot are involved in uh, sugar metabolism and methylation. So we do have an idea of the genomic basis of the susceptible to resistant switch. It comes from another species. It involves, again, the outlier chromosome and um, uh, some, genes, uh, some genes on this outlier chromosome. Uh, these transcriptional changes, they are also associated with some uh, structural variability. What you can see on this uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis, so you have here all the susceptible strains and here all the resistant strains. And the little um, yellow marks here, they show you when you have uh, had a change in the karyotype. And this is expected size for the uh, small outlier chromosome. So again, when you acquire resistance, uh, uh, it's, it, um, some resistant lines, they have uh, the, now, the, the outlier chromosome that has different sizes from susceptible lines. So what we wanted to do um, is to check from the susceptible lines uh, that we um, uh, that we had um, that we had obtained from the other species of Strecopus mediterraneus, uh, see whether we could we could um, uh, um, evolve resistance again and compare as a karyotype between the susceptible and the newly evolved resistant lines. So this is some uh, work that is still in progress, but I'm, I can show you the pulse field gel electrophoresis that has been uh, obtained. So this is this graph. Um, so what you can see here and what was uh, really unexpected is that you do have some karyotypic changes that occur in the susceptible lines. So we were expecting only resistant lines to have, um, to have modified karyotypes, especially on uh, here you have the expected, um, the expected size of the SOC. But actually what this uh, analysis revealed is that there seems to be some structural variability of the small outlier chromosome in susceptible lines too. And meaning that this variability uh, uh, is independent of resistance. Okay, so the take home message of this uh, second part is that the, the genes on this small outlier chromosome undergo massive expression changes when you switch from susceptible to resistance. And we do not know yet for uh, the reverse, so the resistant to susceptible switch, but we will know soon if the lab reopens. Um, the small outlier chromosome may undergo rapid size changes in uh, resistance to susceptible. So this is a deletion we have uh, demonstrated and also uh, susceptible to resistant switches. The um, uh, susceptible, susceptible to resistant and resistant to susceptible switches, they are, they are not the consequence of spontaneous point mutations uh, due to replication errors. So this we know because we have actually estimated the spontaneous point mutation in these species. And uh, the overall conclusion of this is that the host virus coexistence, so in the Osteococcus prosinovirus system, can be maintained by a resistant susceptible phase switch with um, the underlying genomic mechanism uh, still unclear for the susceptible to resistance switch, but uh, it does involve uh, um, transcriptional rewriting and some uh, deletions involved in the resistant to susceptible switch. 
we do not know yet um, uh, whether the viruses is involved in uh, the evolution uh, of resistance. So the switch from susceptible to, to resistance. So what is uh, going, what we're going to do when um, our lab uh, reopens is uh, try to, to resolve the, the molecular basis of the switch. And uh, for that, we plan to uh, sequence more genomes and more transcriptomes from uh, lines that have evolved from resistance to susceptibility and vice versa. We also want to estimate the genome-wide methylation of resistant and susceptible lines. And we have, um, we also plan to start comparing the metabolomes of susceptible and resistant lines with the hope that it will help to understand uh, the, these unknown genes and uh, chromosome uh, 19. So I would like to uh, finish this presentation by thanking all present and past group members that have been heavily involved in the obtentions of all these results. So uh, it has, uh, the people in bold and all our uh, collaborators uh, from uh, the University of Perpignan for the um, uh, theoretical biology, uh, Sussex University for the population genomics, uh, our colleagues from Ghent University for all the genome annotation and comparative genomics that was necessary for this tool. Mathieu Groussin for the ancestral uh, GC uh, composition evolution and the Genoscope, the Genotool and the John Gen Genome Institute for the help with uh, the, the genome sequencing and uh, um, uh, annotation. I would like to thank you for your attention. Hope this all went well and uh, we can have some questions. Great, thank you, Gwen. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I do think it was going out live uh, without any problems. And we have uh, one question that came in from somebody who is watching and um, I'll monitor and see if there's any more. Um, they asked if you considered um, if the switch from resistant to susceptible would be due to a loss of non-coding RNAs or did you just look at the all protein coding? Gene. This is an excellent question. Uh, we are actually in the process of annotating non-coding RNAs in uh, Osteococcus toei. So indeed, they are the usual suspects, uh, but it's true that we need first to finish this annotation and then um, uh, look into this. But indeed, um, this is a, a thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm sure it's pretty complicated. Uh, along with the uh, the complexity of um, all the, the variability between the different strains that might be susceptible and, and resistant. So you've done amazing work just trying to, you know, um, get a handle on that. I had a question about um, some of the genes you said that they might be involved in um, carbohydrate metabolism, the difference between resistance versus uh, susceptible. What do you think uh, the role is of these genes? I mean, I know that you don't have a great sense for it right now, but can you speculate as yeah. to how that might um, influence the difference between the susceptible yeah. and resistance so, so the speculation uh, is actually a very ancient speculation that traces back to the first publication of the genome of the Mamielophysae with the discovery of this outlier chromosome and um, the, the genes involved. And it was um, speculated at the time that, uh, um, that the genes on this chromosome are um, involved in uh, uh, modification of the membrane proteins. So that, uh, yeah, they are changing the, 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 the membrane proteins. And then you can easily imagine how that may uh, affect the resistance or susceptibility by maybe preventing the virus to fix uh, the cell, to enter the cell. Sure. Yes, that certainly would be a mechanism. Although um, I might be confused, but if it's longer, then you have typically more susceptibility, right? Uh, the longer SOC chromosome. Or I guess... Uh, uh, no, it's the opposite. The longer the chromosome, the more resistant you tend to be. Hmm. Okay. So maybe more 
uh, maybe more differences on uh, what's maybe being more, yeah. maybe more complex molecules, um, mm -hmm. yeah, more diversity, more turnover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's also another question. Um, uh, do you see phenotypic changes in the culture when it is growing with the virus, particularly a switch um, to aggregated cell types? That's a very good question. Again, we don't know. Actually, we are uh, we are shaking the cultures for now. Um, so we know we and when we prepare them for transmission electron microscopy, we have to centrifugate them. So that's not super great to prevent to preserve maybe that kind of structure we would have. So for the moment, we don't know. We don't know that. And I think we need uh, yeah, to 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 handle our cultures differently if we would like to see that, like using microfluidics devices, uh, some, some kind of things, but uh, we are not at that uh, point yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that y y we do see uh, a trend where you have an increasing amount of viruses with you know, bacterial populations even. Um, do you think this is a common uh, you know, a mechanism for that? So there's a small percentage of the, the any, any organism that would be susceptible and that's producing the viruses? Or do you think this is unique to this group of, of um, micro uh, uh, eukaryotic plankton? Mm -hmm. um, I don't see, well, the Malielophyces, they comprise a lot of species, 450 million years of evolution. So I, I am sure for two Australopithecus species, I'm pretty sure we can, uh, I'm pretty sure if you look at it, you will find it in other Mammillophyces because they have the, yeah, they have, um, well, the same genome architecture. They have this outlier chromosome. So I, I would imagine that it's the same. Then it has been reported in a completely different lineage in uh, haptophytes that you can also have um, production of viruses in healthy cultures. And I would be tempted to believe that it's um, that resistance is, is too costly in the long run. And so that um, susceptibility reap reappears spontaneously by, by mutation and that this maintains the virus. This is a way for the virus uh, to be maintained in the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really fascinating. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I think uh, I don't ha I see any other questions on the chat. So um, unless you have anything else to say, I think we'll just sign out for now. And thank you again so much for your uh, for your talk. It's wonderful to hear about this and to be able to keep up with the latest science while we're all kind of stuck at home. So thank you again, Gwen. And um, please come back next week. I do think we have another seminar scheduled. And hopefully we won't have the same kind of problems trying to get the live feed um, uh, link working. We'll hopefully next week we'll have that worked out. So thank you all again for your attention and uh, hope to see you back soon. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye. So what I am supposed to do, uh...